All right, I'm going to hit record and I'm going to go live and replicate. Not not personally replicate, you know, the just to clarify. Well, my mind immediately jumped to Wasteland 3, which I was playing last night, and I just got done wiping out a bunch of clones from this uh, mad scientist. So when you say replicate, I, I get scared. Have you seen the movie, um, is it uh, Evolution, the one with the uh, the scientists, the, uh, or the, the, the asteroid that hits down in Arizona? Yeah, Annihilation. It, Always Arizona. Yeah, of it's course. Always Arizona. <laughs> Hal, have you seen that? It has David Duchovny in it. I and Orlando so. Jones. It's it's hilarious. What's and, uh, it? It's called. Is it just Evolution? I I haven't seen that one. I've seen Annihilation, which has a yeah. similar. No, this is a comedy. Oh. Yeah, and there's not a comedy. There's one or, Orlando Jones who, where the uh, the the alien, the the, the insect alien, uh, gets in his suit and then goes into his skin and and he's like down, it's crawling under his skin, down his leg, and and they're like, we gotta take the leg. He's like, don't take the leg, don't take the leg. He's like, no, it's going back up. It's headed towards his groin. He's like, take the leg, take the leg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's pretty funny. So you're recording now and you just live. Of course, we're live streaming. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> We we cleaned it up obviously for the audience. To flip him over and use the forceps to go in and, and retrieve uh, the insect. Yes, it's it's great. Welcome to the Microsoft Community <laughs> Office Hours. If you're uh, still here. Yeah. We're we we had just a casual conversation before we started recording of uh you know like the ongoing theme of uh alien abductions and probing. <laughs> and teaching. So, well, and that has to do with, with just a conversation of Hal being down in Arizona. So I, we connected them somehow. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, here we are. So, uh, Christian Buckley, we've got uh, Mike Nelson, Hal Hostetler, and Sean McDonough. And we could have some other folks showing up. I don't know what the problem is with Riz with being on time if he's going to join us. It's not like the Canadians uh, ha- are celebrating our Labor Day. Maybe, maybe he is. It'll be casually late. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So, a- anything else going going on this week? This this holiday day today, gentlemen. It's a holiday, you know. It's a uh, it's you know barbecue tonight. It's uh, you know hanging out, having a cocktail or two. My wife made homemade black bean burgers yesterday. Oh, there he is. There he is. There's. there's I, I, apparently your your ears were itching there because we just mocked you. <laughs> oh, we mocked you very well. Yes, yes, <laughs> we mock you very well. <laughs> yeah, because you know you, you just casually show up whenever Riz wants to show up. He just makes an entrance. And by th- and by that you mean every Monday at eleven o'clock. No, you're late. You're two minutes late. That's not late. <laughs> I have a firm. I have a firm five-minute rule. It was the probe, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's what we were talking. You missed the conversation about uh, alien abductions and and probes. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. For those we do have a few people that are watching the stream. Uh, if you are joining us, we've got a bunch of questions that we're going to go through. If you do have questions about Microsoft products or services you'd like to ask the panel, we'll uh, make an attempt at answering them. If you have questions around telephony stuff, you're out of luck. <laughs> Someday we'll we'll get uh, like Adam Ball or or uh, uh, Jonathan McKinney or something to, to to join us. Somebody that's a UC expert, maybe uh, Tom or uh somebody that knows something about that. I actually, I mean, I I see those questions occasionally because we're answering questions from the Office 365 community and the Microsoft Teams community out on Facebook. Uh, occasionally stuff out from tech community as well, but we've got a full list of questions that have come in over the last few days. Um, but uh, feel free to post them. Uh, I was just say I skip over the telephony stuff, just knowing once in a while I'll throw one in, knowing that we're not going to be able to answer it. You know, we just all kind of do the universal. Uh, he likes to see everyone flounder. That's right. Floundering is good. Um <laughs> All right, so why don't we kick the well? So, is, is there anything else? Anything uh, you want to bring homework that you want to talk about? Oh, 
uh, homework last time. I was scripting to change owners for teams well, in right. bulk. Yeah. Um, so I did write a blog post for that and wrote a script for it. I'll uh, go ahead and post that here as soon as I find, <laughs> as, as I type. Excellent. Yeah. So that um, I think there there was kind of there's kind of a sister question for that in today's list that's asking about another bulk uh, change. It's a, it's to exchange, but you know people want to do the same thing. The the, the problem with some of the uh, admin console experiences is that there it's it's one by one, and so people have questions often about uh, going in and doing them in bulk. All right. Let me grab that and I'll post that over in the book of faces as well. Yeah, I was going to try and let Mark Diaz know personally, but I did not know. There are a lot of Mark Diaz's out there. So rather than spam all of them. I think it's, he's cousins with uh, John Smith, isn't he? So if you ask John, he might know. Yep. Usually hangs out John Smith with uh, Jennifer White. That's right. But not and Julia White. That's Steph uh, and, and Stephanie uh, Jones. Yeah. Make, make sure when you when you do the recap, Buckley, that we we uh, hashtag Julia White for that one. Of, of course. All right. Well, She'll we'll, appreciate that. Hi, Julia. I'm not checking. Yeah. I used to do that as a kid. You would would check the like. What are the most common names? And uh, hey, did you get Julie Julie Hernandez? Did she ever get back to us about being on a show? Uh, oh, she no. was the one asking yeah. all the questions last week. Christian yes. got a hold of her. So I did chat with her. She'd love to join us. I, I <laughs> This being the holiday, I didn't want to afford it, so I'm going to try and get her to join us next Monday. Cool. So she's she again stated that uh, she, that she's not an expert, uh, but she does have a lot of questions. So like perfect. So so yeah, clean it up for next week. <laughs> that would be interesting to have somebody on screen with us to see if we actually help with something. Right, yeah. That's We've kind very, of been making okay. some very big assumptions. Very I'll, negative. I'll, Come on. <laughs> I'll make sure that she uh, that she submits the questions three plus days in advance, that our team and support have time to fully vet the questions and come up with our responses. Uh, all right, so with that, why don't we jump in as we're waiting for any other questions. Again, anybody that's watching in the live stream, if you have questions, feel free to type them out. I'm monitoring over uh, in Facebook as well. Uh, but question number one coming from Jamie. Um, oh, this is a performance issue with, with Teams, with video. In Teams, when I play a video, it appears choppy to others. I am following all the steps, but to no avail any suggestions. So, yeah, go ahead, John. I was just going to say I just dropped a couple of links, and I was looking at this ahead of time. There are a million different things it could be. Um, before I say anything, I will let Mr. Nelson offer his thoughts. So, yeah, the only thing I was going to offer is we, we investigated this a little bit when we were starting to show videos on GoToMeeting, right? So another platform like Teams. And it was causing kind of the same thing, but... It turned out that it was really kind of a because what you're doing is you're you're just sharing a screen which is actually showing a video, and um, your your the video itself isn't made to show on the screen. The video was created, um, you know, to not go from you know into a live stream into a, a streaming type of of, of, uh, of avenue, if you will. Uh, and it was you know it came, when it came down to it, it was encoding. It was how the stream was, uh, the video was actually encoded. And what they did was they encoded an AAC format. Um, and, you know, we found that if we switched to MP4, everything kind of smoothed itself out. Um, and we kept it down to 720p on the resolution. So there are a whole bunch of factors that are involved when you're actually, you're streaming yourself, but then you're restreaming a video inside of, you know, you're sharing a screen. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, what, how the video was actually cr uh, created. Yeah, there's there's a difference between sharing your entire screen and sharing the application. 
Uh, so that's another thing. If you have limited bandwidth and you find that things are choppy, I mean, obviously you can go and shut down your Outlook and uh, any other desktop applications you're not using actively that you need to present with. Um, but that's kind of a rule of thumb is is to also um, share the individual application versus. And it's again it comes down to encoding. It's just encoded differently, so higher quality goes through. Yeah. It's kind of it, it, it kind of reminded me of uh, just on the quality issue of people that are are overly fanciful about the uh, devices that they're using to capture video and oh yeah I've got 4K or maybe even 8K capable. It's like great. Well, you know, YouTube is limited 1080. Yeah. So good <laughs> good for you, Mr. Yeah. Cinematic. Yeah. Well, yeah. and Adam plus I've got a CEO that contacted me about how to present video. Um, you know, because he was going to be given in all hands and the company was like 200, uh, a little under shy of 200 people. And he's like doing a, a, a webinar blast teams live, uh, live meeting. Um, and I was like, he's like, well, we got this thing. We did it in, in high def, you know, I had it professionally done and it's, you know, and I'm like, okay, so you had it professionally done. Well, yeah, because I was going to show it at a live T a live meeting you know, on, on a screen when everybody's physically there. I said, you realize you're going to be streaming this. So it's going to be like choppy. It's going to be pixelated. It's going to be, and he's just like, oh, crap. I paid all his money for it and everything. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, th that's that's the footage that you include on the uh, on the DVD in the uh, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> bloopers. It'll be high quality bloopers on it. Well, there yeah. is a difference. And I had a great conversation. A good friend of mine, Matt Hughes, everybody pretty much knows Matt. Uh, in the SharePoint space, I guess I should clarify that. Um, but uh, for for Mike and and uh, and Hal, but uh, so he has a video production company, and it, we're talking to him about you know the difference. Like I went out and bought a very expensive camera. I've got a a, a Lumix GHC, and it does beautiful video. And I got it more for video quality. Kind of same thing. Most of what I'm doing when I'm sitting behind the desktop, and obviously we're not doing much traveling this year, so I'm not lugging my camera around, but it's just higher quality. Having a, a higher quality device, uh, even going to 1080p, it does allow for wider shots. It gives you more control over the edits. So when you go in and you are editing that 1080p version, you have more options in the, the scene. But at the end of the day, it's 1080 to 1080. It's just whether it's going to be more zoomed in or broader and th that kind of stuff. So, so having the, I, you know, having the nicer equipment is a good thing for that kind of, not quite what the question is. I know we went a little bit sideways yeah. on it, but. It's the same 1080, thing. 1081. Yeah, you gotta think, you gotta think of your audience too, right? I mean, does everybody have high speed? Can they actually watch that video in, in 1080p? No. <laughs> no. Well, and that's the the beauty too of the you know auto you know, uh, adjust of that on YouTube and, uh, and Vimeo and and uh, even through stream of it automatically will adjust to what you're able to consume and give you an even more degraded experience. Yeah, yeah, and that's very well could be with the situation that Jamie is experiencing though too, because some folks will see it as choppy or pixelated if that is you know if they just have a a bad internet connection. Yeah. Let's not forget the fact or the possibility that, you know, he could be trying to manipulate all of this uh, video on a dual core Pentium of days your that does not do so well, maybe doesn't have video acceleration. So just to be politically correct, you just assume that was a, a male, uh, Jamie, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have a brother named Jamie. So do I. Wait a second, Sean. Same brother? We should check. Let's talk afterwards. No way. No way. We could be brothers or half brothers. Who knows? I'm Who knows? sure of it. That would explain. I've often so felt this connection. I know. I know. So well, it's it, it. You know, seeing him every Monday, Monday morning on video, it's like looking into a mirror. So, <laughs> at least the therapist told me to call it a connection. <laughs> All right, let's uh, jump question two. Um, Robin Ann asks, uh, need help escalating an Office 365 ticket that has been ongoing <laughs> since the 3rd of August? Uh, unresponsive <laughs> agents in passing the buck. 
<laughs> yeah, and we I, can do I, that. I wanted to throw this one out there. Just yeah. Where's the deal? deal? General feedback. Do we, with, do we deal with matters of the heart, guys? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. It sounds very personal. I don't know if I want to touch it. We can't she even get our own tickets escalated. Yeah. <laughs> I are so aren't we here to provide emotional support, people? Come on. You know, we're we're there. We're feel your pain. Have you put your issue up on user voice? We can we can all vote for it once you once you complain. Yeah, well, yeah, you, can't, you can't put a support ticket on user voice and kill it right away. That's right. So you can post the issue out to tech communities. Tech communities and we can look, yeah. We can and there's a lot of product team members and engineering team members that are out there actively on a daily basis and may see it and respond. Um, we have stated this in the past. It's just a kind of a general reminder that the support organization is different than the product teams. And they may be unaware of and not receive feedback on some of the issues that are out there. It could be something the product team is more than likely to respond back if it's a roadmap issue and at least let you know, uh, you know, hey, this is not a high priority for us or this is on the roadmap, but it's not, there's no date on it or it's actively being worked. We're aware of it. We're trying to resolve it. Uh, at least you'll get some feedback on that. If it's I will say too. Product. I will say too, is it also sort of depends on how you actually contacted support, right? So yeah, obviously if you have premium support, that's a different, you're in a different category. You're in a different queue, if you will. Um, but if you just filled out the form on Office 365 and you put it as like a low priority, or you said that it wasn't, you know, uh, wasn't an immediate need or the way you described it, um, you know, they, they inferred that it's, you know, like, you're triaged a little bit lower. Um, you know, I've taken the steps where I've actually said, "Hey, I'm down." You know, this is a, this is a down event. This is a P1, and uh, you know, I've gotten a pretty quick response when I do that. <laughs> it's like the the Michael Scott approach. Yeah, I label. I, I send all my my notices as nine one one. You know, and uh, there's nine one one one. Or 911A, 911B, 911C, 911A, super important, need to drop everything. 911B, you can hold off. 911C, not really important, just ignore it. Exactly. Uh, I would offer a suggestion if you've got any ticket ID or number, um, if you're looking to get assistance or someone else to look at that um, for you, Robin, it, or Robin Ann it would be best to include the ticket ID. Yeah. Yes, when you're posting it out to tech community, when you're reaching out to somebody, when you're emailing Bill Bear. <laughs> <laughs> we can't help you any longer you're, with that. You have um, his email address, you're gonna, you're gonna put his email address in the, in the chat, right? You, you can't limit, Sean, what Bill can and can't do. There's, you often wonder where the phrase poke the bear comes from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bear. For those that don't know, uh, Bill, Bill Bear, longtime Microsoft uh, uh, guy. Is he, what is he, a product marketing, product engineering? He's, he's a PM, he's, but he was he owned uh, uh, all of the, uh, the, the the big topics around SharePoint. Um, all the core uh, the, infrastructure the infrastructure stuff so he's now moved over to search and ai and and doing some different things but he was always very free and open with his email but not relevant as well as yeah. his thoughts on some things yes <laughs> a good man known to all yeah hey yeah. so why don't we uh do the t-shirts oh. what do we have going on today should i switch yeah. views so you can see him a little bit better hang on I'll turn it back to gallery mode here. Yeah, we're kind of recycling a little bit today because I, I mean, I just have my SpaceX, my, my Falcon, Falcon Heavy, you know, F9, but that's that's it. That's cool. Eric has Eric, his disappearing T-shirt. Yeah. Eric and is I just flushed. It's just black today. Yeah, the black <laughs> is the new black. That's what I hear, though. It is. But you know what I do have? I, that I have a vintage uh, SharePoint hat. Nice. My boy. Well, that's very nice. For anybody who's uh, who's interested. Well, you can auction it off to the top bidder. 
Christian oh. will now. It even says SharePoint back. Very cool. Yeah, I don't have that one. It's vintage now. I mean, the logo, everything's different. So, yep. got a Dad few Martini. of those. Check eBay following the show today. <laughs> yeah, I have the, uh, so I've got the office one up there, which is, that's a, 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 an Alistair Pugin special there. But I have, for those that don't know, I know I've worn this before, but uh, this is uh, from the Kingdom of Loathing online oh, multiplayer game. Stick figures, text-based, hilarious. It's Liquid fantastic. TV on my uh, MTV used to have stick figure theater, which was uh, pretty good. Yeah, I remember that. Yep. All right, switching back over. We're in together mode. I feel more together when we're in together mode in the live stream. So. Uh, all right, so question three, Vikram says, I have created a retention policy for email. I want to apply this policy for all users in our organization. How can I apply this to all users in our org? Can anyone suggest how to go about this? Vikram, you're out of luck, thanks. Pulling that, I'm pulling that. <laughs> So I want to understand, I mean, anything that's in 365 Exchange Admin that deals around retention or legal hold or whatever else is there, that can be, that can be applied to groups, right? Yeah. Not just single users, but groups. So if he has his organization embedded into a single group, he should be able to apply it to everyone. Right. Put the entire tenant on legal hold. Well... <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying. I mean, or you can go and create that group and apply that policy to those people or that that. Yeah. Division. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I guess I don't understand because I mean, it tells you right in the when you're creating a policy if you're a, who to apply it to, and you can pick groups. So. I assume that in orgs, I mean, at least one of the standard practices that I've seen is they have orgs where you, you know, set up all users or all, you know, all company kind of a group, all tenant, or all whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you just apply it to that. Everyone not external. Yeah. Well, that uh, would be part of uh, a governance uh, uh, activity to, to understand hey is this a policy that is company-wide apply here if it's yeah and there's there's plenty of guidance out in uh, docs.microsoft.com on applying uh, global policies around each of the services i know there were a couple re responses people saying well hey there's this you can build this script it's like that's in the console to be able to apply a global yeah it's there <laughs> Right. All right. Let me jump to question number four. Hey, this comes from somebody named Tracy. I got no help for her. So this, it's it's uh, so, so hey, MVPs can have questions too. So this is comes from good friend of ours down out of uh, Johannesburg, okay. South Africa, Tracy Vanderskiff. So she says, uh, anyone else experiencing issues with downloading Microsoft Teams live event reports, so the recordings, et cetera? I've logged tickets. They inform me that a synchronization was ran back on, on back end, but still no joy. I can see the files, but nothing happens when I click to download. I've tried different browsers, different PCs, as well as different user accounts. One thing I would ask. Sorry, Hal? I said, are you in the right tenant? She sees them and she's clicking and the the well, expected well, output. The reason I ask that is that if I am in my business tenant and I'm off looking at something in the Microsoft guest tenant, I have credentials there, but if I'm not logged into that tenant, I can't open anything. Or it gives me an error, or it fails, or something comes up. Trying to read a video, or watch a video, or, or open a document, or something like that, and it will simply fail unless I'm in the right tenant. I'm logged into that tenant. Yep. Hey Tracy, um, I see that you've got the. It looks like the Teams client open. 
if you go ahead and try in incognito or through the web application, does it get you anywhere? Because at least in the web application, it would resolve Hal's issue because the web application is going to be tied to where you're logged in because of the need to do that when you go into the web app. So that's a thought. Other than that, I yeah. don't know. Well, the, the other thing I was going to suggest too, if this is if to Hal's point, if she is logged in with the right credentials into the right tenant, not logged in as a guest, which is, it, it happens very frequently. I wish that was just part of when I click on a, 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 a meeting invite that would recognize that I'm <laughs> logged in elsewhere and move, switch me over to the right tenant automatically. Um, it does. There is a prompt now that it wasn't always there that asks if you want to log in with the current, you know, you're currently logged into this. Do you want to switch accounts? Um, so there, there is that that dialogue box. But assuming that she's in the right place, with the right credentials, she's clicking on reports, trying to download things that she's been able to do in the past, and it's not working. I hate saying this, but wait a little while. <laughs> this is kind of the uh, you know, if there's something that's happening in the in the data center um, that that is just for some reason things are not fully updated or what have you. And, and it, with the, a lot of these cloud services, you have to give it a little time for something to process, something to happen. Um, you can't kind of force quit on a process running on the server and the, you know, the, the Microsoft data center. Um, and it, it seems like some of the other feedback, some of the comments that she made later on, that it just started working again later and I think that may have been the waiting part may have been the resolution, but why that's that's happening if there could be other causes to that issue. The waiting is the hardest part. It is. We are very much a, a now generation, generations. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, I was going to make a Phil Hartman SNL reference, but probably nobody would get it. I'll do it anyway. I, I want get... my tongue bath now. <laughs> I miss Phil Hartman. It was one of the uh, the Dieter uh, skits, Mike Myers. Now yeah. it's the show where we dance. And, sprockets. Uh, sprockets. Sprockets. And uh, yeah, Phil Hartman. Love Phil Hartman. All right. Um, Pele uh, ask uh, anyone who knows what happens to the free members when I upgrade from Microsoft Teams free to paid? Do they become guests? Hey, Hal, this goes back to our abduction conversation. Do they become yeah. uh, guests, remain as free members, or do they also have to have a paid version? What did your uh, research into this reveal, Christian? Uh, um, free versus paid? No, I, so I know <laughs> I know the answer to this from from some of my research. You mock me, but I have started to read. I've just not blogged about it. Yet. So what's the answer? Any thoughts yeah. before I? I don't I can't know. tell you. That was a nice warm up. I mean, yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> yeah. So he's working on. You it. got a head of steam here. Use it. <laughs> Yeah, well, so so nothing happens to the other users that are on the free. They still remain. If you're the admin that uh, you, with, you know, what changes uh, for your environment, does it affect the other free users? So if you're sending out a meeting invite as you're now a paid Teams user, you send a meeting invite, they'll still be able to log in using their free uh, access to that. Um, there is, uh, I don't know what the ratio is, uh, it, like it, it may be that for some of your users, you need to go and create, uh, and invite them, re-invite them as guests and create guest accounts for them. I don't know what the ratio is of free guests to paid users. Is that, is Microsoft tinkered with that? It used to be like five to one. Is it still generically? You don't know? No idea. Yeah. It's one of those things. I'll add it to my. Research notes. <laughs> Here's my pen. There it is. I'm I've writing, writing intently of what I'm going to go and research. Mm. Yes. 
Oh yeah, that's a really good point that I just made there in my notes. <laughs> Intently, quite <laughs> Um Yeah, so I think uh, you know, overall, uh, uh, you know, free users are still free users. You send them a meeting invite, they'll still be able to to go through their free accounts. Um, all right, nothing else to add to that one. All right. Sasha asks, uh, anyone know if there's a way to downgrade Office 2019 that came with Microsoft 365 apps for business to Office 2016? There are some Windows 7 computers that exist on the network uh, and they don't support Office 2019. Yes. The, first thing the answer is yes. Do, yes. <laughs> but you need to get rid of the uh, you need to get rid of Windows 7. Is you, the, my question to that is is it truly downgrading them or you can do a side by side install it's no it's it, well it depends if you have the msi version there's nothing that you can do with it if you've got the click to run version then there is uh, you either use the microsoft the office deployment toolkit and uh, just reset the configuration in the xml file or there is a uh, there is a little command little application Let's see. I just brought that up. Uh, that's the wrong one. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I was going to say that other one. And like it's Carl the. Uh, that's that's, that's what's like. around making faces down there. I'm not no, making those sounds. I am. Yeah. The Office C2R client. There is a nice little thing about that one that you go in and run it, and you can update to whatever version you want. And in the case of Office 365, you're talking features, not so much a different system. And theoretically, that'll work. So let me post that uh, link here. Hey, and just personally, I found the easiest way to do it is to use the the Office deployment toolkit um, to just change and make a change to the customization file for the particular machine, because then you don't have to worry about you know what the output will be because it's just it just installs whatever you want, you know, you tell the, the toolkit to install. So it's That's pretty cool. simple. Didn't know that. And here's another little link that shows you the command line. And that's just, you can ignore that particular version that's showing in there. What you need is the, the appropriate version for 2016. Uh, that is pretty quick and simple. You just run that, and then you run with run Office Update, and it uh, it just fills it right in. That's uh, there was a uh, problem. Oh, what I guess about three four weeks ago, where they did something on the back end, and people would open up Outlook, and uh, it would stay up for a moment, and then just go away. And uh, that was a thing that they had on the back end that the uh, feature switch that they had to unswitch on the back end. <coughs> was within the wrong place or some such and uh, the, the quick fix for that was to revert to the the prior version and uh so i posted a whole bunch of articles on that one excellent um it's it's a sim kind of simple similar to if you're running office and uh you want to change what channel you're on from monthly to inside of something like that that's basically just a registry edit mm. that makes sense in that context yeah kind of the first where you started the comment i, I think there was some feedback uh in facebook where people can kind of respond the same way it's like why do you still have people that are on you know windows 7 and it's no longer supported by microsoft that's that's another problem yeah well, yeah, a lot of people need their IT staffs to upgrade them. And I can tell you that universities and other folks who have one support person for a multi hundred person organization, they'd love to upgrade, but it's not the first thing on their list. Simply keeping people working is hard enough. Is there extended support for seven right now or is it is it done? Done. Yeah. Yeah, so there's the that adds a tremendous risk to an organization that's not prioritized that. And Microsoft has is made this the transition, the move to ten, um, free, 
free. Basically, you can still do that if you have a Windows 7 machine. You can upgrade it to 10 for free. And then there are those people running XP still. (laughs) I was walking by a bank machine probably six months ago here in Toronto. And it had clearly done its its blue screen and it was crying for attention. And I watched the the XP logo bouncing around the screen. (laughs) That's the stuff you need to capture on video, Eric. I'll I'll try next time. I'm sure I'll I'll be able to see it again. But that's one of those times when you realize that you have a a particular – you know, set of, of knowledge that others don't as you're standing there laughing and other people are wondering <laughs> what going up and down. Yeah. Well, it seems but, to hey. me that either my last trip or the trip before my last up to the summit, I happened to be watching an airline terminal and computer and that was running MT4. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, MT4. Wow. I, I nice. saw an NT machine, yeah, like it was like a year ago. Um, well, I was just going to make the comments. Look, there are people that have that skill set to work with some of the technology. It's, I always joke about how um, in the early 90s, I was working for EDS, EDS Medical, so in Northern California. And EDS was a big consulting company at the time, and they're gone now. But um, they, uh, uh, they tried to enlist me to become a COBOL programmer. And I declined, and, uh, and and I had a new couple of people that went and did that, and went on to make a whole lot of money around Y2K, and after that, but they've stayed very happily, gainfully employed, um, and made you know, uh, I don't know, on average a hundred or hundred fifty dollars per hour more than me, um, doing that in the financial sector. Very specialized. There's a lot fewer and fewer people that are doing that because they all retired and bought islands. Uh, yeah. that, Once that they're kind of alive. Thing. Yeah. You, you say that, and I just I not even a year ago working with insurance two insurance companies, and they still have you know they still have their Z series. Yeah. And uh, it's all COBOL. Yep. Um, or RPG, and uh, they still employ. I mean, one of the companies had over thirty. COBOL programmers, yeah. and these are people that are our age that are making a lot of money doing I, what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I worked for a comp- that one of those companies in the Midwest. They gave every incoming employee in IT a COBOL test, still ran tons of stuff on JCL, um, oh, yeah. mainframe policy yeah. system, mainframe-based policy systems, It's yeah. and they hadn't upgraded. In fact... <laughs> There were still people at the organization that referred to um, cl- everything was e- either on the mainframe or client server. Yeah. Okay. Or open systems. Yeah. Exactly. Open system. Exactly. Exactly. And I'll tell you another thing is that this company that I was working with was setting up a DR, and they were working with a, if you've never heard SunGuard is a popular DR solution. Oh yeah. And they were, and they got rid of SunGuard, and they were trying to come up with their own solution. And, uh, you know, their own solution was going into a colo data center. But uh, basically, they had to shell out, um, you know, seven figures for another Z-series. So they're actually putting money into, you know, the iron. They're they're still putting money into big iron. Yep. Wow. (laughs) SunGuard bought LG RPS. Closer to our home, uh, to kind of our, our, our world, there's uh, there's still it's amazing the number of organizations that have massive file share infrastructures that are out there. But it's the same same reasons that they've gone and they've done built integrations, all these customizations, all this other stuff in the back end. It's not as simple as hey, we want to move to the cloud or we want to move over here. It's like you know to to uh, to roll out that solution if you have. Um, you know, everybody is relying on their Z drive to for this, and, and there's automations in place that uh, for major, you know, workflows, business systems, um, dependencies and integrations. Yeah, yeah. They kill you. And that yeah. was one of the biggest arguments against, you know, OneDrive when it came out on the client level. OneDrive, you know, they thought that was going to be, hey, we can just switch everything over to OneDrive. The problem is, is that, you know, OneDrive isn't. That's not what it's made for. Number one. Um, but also Azure Files. So experience with Azure Files, Azure, the folks at Microsoft actually thought Azure Files was going to be the godsend for people who had shared drives. And I'm telling you right now, it's not even, <laughs> it didn't make that impact whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I mean, 
you can't you can't have that drive it, all users look for is a drive letter that's all they care about is a drive letter yeah. and they all know it as their h drive or their z drive or their whatever and so they can throw all of their their uh, mp3s and all their video files and everything that they're not work related up there so you have literally gigs and terabytes of space that these users are using up um, PST files, Hal, you know, your favorite, you know, you get a nice, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> accessible with LAN bandwidth and latency. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the mainframe, the, I, I just, it, it just blows my mind that they're, the, the industries are still investing so much money into those and so much money into the programming behind them. You know, literally projects that take 10 years, they're talking 20 year project just to get off of a mainframe. 20 years. I mean, IBM's got another 20 years worth of cash coming in. You know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, question number seven. Steve asks uh, Is it possible to have multiple presenters on the screen at the same time in a Teams live event? Sure, they yes. stand next to one another. That's yeah. pretty much it. Right, it was a trick. It's a trick answer. That's right, Eric. Yeah. Is I got it. And you, all right, Sean. Yeah. No. <laughs> actually, as I'm shaking my head, no, I have to be interrupted with the another answer, which actually works. That's so upsetting. <laughs> uh, yeah, Grandma. Add that to the score, Eric. Come on. <laughs> it's all so, about yeah. the experience, Buckley. Yeah. No, Eric, you want to answer that though? The primary question that they're asking, besides. Uh, Sean's joke answer, which is true, but not <laughs> realistic. Yes, the answer is no. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's is that is that actually true? And the reason why I asked that is because we're giving kind of a explanation because some folks were asking when we first set up Teams for, um, as some of the audience may not know, is that we have a summit every year, and uh, this year we had our first virtual summit. And we had about three or four thousand people from around the world, and they used Teams for that. And it was the first uh, exposure a lot of MVPs had to Teams, and they were at that scale, uh, right? A lot of yeah, at yeah. scale, a lot of frustrations. <laughs> yeah. um, and one of the things we asked about is we would have two presenters on the screen at the same time um, during some of our sessions, and we were like, "How does that work?" You know? And they said it's the producer. So when you're doing a live event, you have a producer. And the producer can show their screen, which has just the two people on it. So you can have two presenters on the screen at the same time if the producer puts it out that way. Right. So that's, you know, and Eric, I don't, I, you know, you know a lot more about it than I do, but that's what they explained to us on the Microsoft side that they did. So Yeah, I mean, technically that's correct. Technically that's correct. But I don't think that's the answer to the person's question. I mean, they're well, talking yeah. about, you know, taking the yeah. native capability. Exactly. Yeah. If two of us wanted to present at the same time, could we do that? Whether it's on screen, whether it's video of the, of the presenter or what have you, the answer right now is no. At the same time, going back to the, the MVP Summit point, I would say a few things. One is um, that was, what, March, April? So early day, I mean, what we look at today, six, seven months ago as early days of COVID, early days of all the releases that are now public knowledge. Yep. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that particular feature because it's not the first time I've heard it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, become available, in the, I would say, in the next year. Well, it is a reason, though, why uh, so many uh, of the events that are coming on, like you have the, uh, for those that folks that don't know, it's in pilot currently, but there is a, a Microsoft community tenant that uh, so Microsoft is owns the governance of this managing this of course but it's for user groups and events to go in and create a space on a Microsoft tenant um, and there's a I won't go into all the details of what's included within that but why a lot for a lot of these events that are starting to, to, to come together we're using meetings rather than live events Live events natively, the out-of-the-box capability today is great with a single presenter and you're broadcasting something out like a keynote. But when you want interaction, when you want a panel like this, um, then you use the meetings capability. 
to the point though around using o OBS like so right now people that are watching the live stream if you're watching this on YouTube you see the, the the you know the the regular gallery view in that recording but for the live stream you're seeing the together mode so just like I can you know I, I can use a you know the, uh, the OBS I'm essentially sharing my desktop sharing the screen um, and whatever view that I piece together so I could actually in this because I'm sharing the entire screen i can turn off the together mode i can bring in and slide over that uh you know the the team's window and i can have other people in picture i can do a bunch of creative things i can be sharing slides while we're chatting as a panel in together mode over on the side uh, you know I, I have a lot of options what i can go in and do because it's obs where it's a it's the open broadcast software it's open source like run, like owning your own TV station, it's a bit finicky to go and set those things up. But you can create those views or those scenes, however you want to do those the the layout. So that is possible. It gets very complicated very quickly, though. Well, does anyone know if if uh, some of the competing products, Zoom, whatnot, can do that? Can you have multiple presenters and speakers? So yeah, so Zoom you can't, right? Um, no. Natively. Um, WebEx, you can, uh, but WebEx, as we all know, is like, you know, the, the, the prime, uh, you know, most expensive you could get. You can also have, uh, what I found out in WebEx is we have one, one customer, um, that we use WebEx with, and you can actually have a separate music channel, uh, where you're actually, yeah, it's an actual separate, a separate feed, um, that you can bring into a, yeah. Um, but, uh, I don't know about GoToMeeting. Um, and uh, if anybody else is using anything, can you do it in, in Google? What is that called? Google Meet now or Google whatever it's called? It used to be Hangouts. Products formerly known as Hangouts. Yeah. yeah. Help me, OBS. You're my only hope. <laughs> yeah, my only experience with, with Hangouts um, when, when it was uh, still a thing and, and there were some events like the Cloud 365 um, team um, went and built customized Hangout, so they could do that and have multiple presenters. But they, but they built a custom coded solution on top of Hangouts. So we would use Hangouts just because you could. You at one point it was the only platform you could use that would allow over like, you know, five or six video screens on at a time. Right. And you know, all the other ones would only allow like two or three. And uh, what is it called now? It's not called Google Hangouts. It's called like Meet or something. They change the name of it. I think it's Google Meet. But I, I would stay tuned because I can see that being something that um, they'll roll out sooner than later. Makes sense. Yeah, Google Meet. Google Meet. Well, obviously, it was a massive branding win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's not exactly up there in the top uh, the top three in use. That's for sure. Yeah, apparently, a branding person left Microsoft, went to work for Google. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, next question Debbie asks Any thoughts on why some items uh, end up in my inbox on my laptop, but junk on my phone, or vice versa, where I delete them from one device and it does not delete from the other? What kind of account is this? Yes. An Outlook account? Email. Yes. Well, yes. yes. <laughs> App account, IMAP account. Yeah. Exchange. I mean, I can appreciate the fact that the, the junk filters put things in different places. I see that here. Um, but as far as deleting a message in one place and not having it delete in the other, that sounds like a pop account. Yeah. And none of this applies in a pop account. Yeah, leave, leave. There's a little setting that says leave messages on server. <laughs> Answer yes always. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a that's a a, a good point. Is uh, so I like I have my Outlook. I was in fact last week was setting up for one of my kids, who was asking. I want says I don't. I hate having to open up multiple email accounts. You know, like why are you doing it that way? Use Outlook. As your primary and map in the other ones and 
have one location for all of your email. And, uh, and so, yeah, the, I, so I was thinking about some of those policies you have, those, those options and uh, to where is that email coming from and go back and look at it. If it's through a pop, change the settings. Yeah, the setting is, you know, leave on, leave on server. So what it does is it brings the email into your PC, but it leaves it on the server. So if your phone connects to your mailbox, the phone says, hey, that mail's there. I'm going to retrieve that mail. And so now, you know, even though you delete it on your PC, if it's cached, it hasn't made it to the server. The server's still holding the mail. Your phone gets the, the mail. That's where you're getting your disconnect. <laughs> During my recent system rebuild, I learned of another behavior with the Outlook client, at least with Office 365 on the back end. I have a POP account that uh, has restricted send policies for SMTP. Uh, I've got to come from a specific address to send. Um, and I noticed sometimes when I set it up in the past, it would work anywhere and other times it wouldn't because I wasn't on the specific segment with the specific address. Well, in looking at Fiddler, I was seeing that my POP and IMAP accounts were being brokered through Office 365, through the Exchange backend. It wasn't going directly to that account. And, but that's not always the case. And I wonder what the rules are around that. If you, it depends on how you set it up. And if you don't believe me, set up Fiddler and watch your traffic go back and forth. If you set up the account and you give it the address of your POP account, it will attempt to broker that through the Exchange backend. But if you set it up manually, it'll go direct to the POP account. Well, that I've never seen before. I'll have to look at that one. Yeah. It's just that easy, folks. It's just <laughs> I, it surprised the heck out of me, but then it made me think of all those times when I'm like, yeah, well, when I was at the conference, I could get that mail and send that mail just fine without getting the bounced back at me because I'm not coming from the right place. Well, the good news now is that there are no conferences, so you don't have to worry about that problem. <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> Who knew? that the root of COVID was a bunch of uh, email admins, exchange admins, trying to yeah. solve the problem. Problem they solved. Would be. <laughs> it's all ball bearings these days. All right, <laughs> next. All right, so the next one, question nine, comes from someone who has one of the coolest names ever, Pablo Garfunkel. Come on. He, he, that's like a, a Renaissance man name. Like, I, I okay, anyway. Run it. This is a little bit longer one. Uh, I run a team, uh, sales ops of uh, 20 people providing sales support to a worldwide sales team of 250 reps. I want to have a channel in Teams or perhaps an app that gets added to each group's team that allows the rep to open a conversation thread with sales ops, like a live I need help type of thing, similar to how Intercom behaves. I have no developers at my disposal, no third-party licenses like Intercom. How can I accomplish this with organic Office 365 features using Teams and Flow? I cannot have just a public channel. So a lot of people is like, why can't you have a, a public channel? Uh, imagine the noise of 250 plus to 20 people trying to maintain conversations in one place. So any thoughts on how to address that? You've got 250 reps dealing with 20 people at headquarters. You want to be able to open up essentially like a, I need help, like a ticketing system. It's essentially, isn't that what he's saying? He wants a ticketing system. In teams. In teams. Well, if you think about it, you can add as an, add as an app. Yep. Um, you add it as an app, or again, I go back to my my love for uh, IoT and flows. Is the ability to have you know any message come across, you can assign to a flow, which goes into an app like ServiceNow and executes a ticket. Right. And then you can have that person, that rep of the team of twenty, 
that can yep. respond back via chat directly, and that's a one-on-one -on -one with that person. And you right. can have dozens of those chats open. You can also have a bot that does the same thing. So, um, you know, having it, they, and there's a bunch of bots out there people have created. ServiceNow actually has their own bot. I don't know if they make it for Teams. Uh, they make it for Slack. Um, and uh, it allows, you know, for instant interaction with tickets and uh, with, the, uh, with the support people um, just by, you know, a bot asking questions and responding. That's it. Yep. And I have to imagine they have some kind of ticketing system in place that they're using. If not, um, you know, they, they could go and create something and track all that inside of SharePoint and interact with Teams. I'm sure IFTTT has has an integration with that. I I, I don't know. I can look. But There's a number of them that are out there. I mean, that, if you go out there and look, and you know, depending on what they already have in place, uh, I, I'd be surprised if an organization of that size doesn't already have a ticketing system that they can go and leverage for this. So just a quick, just so you know, just a quick search under apps and teams, um, service bot, uh, service test plus cloud, uh, you know, user voice, um, Jira. If you've ever used Jira for your ticketing, those are all apps that are available directly in Teams. And I know you can get a Jira instance for free. Yep, can. Yeah. All right, Pablo, problem solved. <laughs> well, except for the hard work of actually creating the thing. But yeah, yeah. we're just we're we're the idea guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so I think we got time for one more question, possibly two. Uh, Jen's asked, uh, you used to be able to use the forms app w within a, a meeting chat. And, and apparently, uh, so I've not, I wasn't using it in meeting chats. Uh, do you know if there's a way to get that back? The forms app so and I meetings chat. I know you could do surveys in, inside of a chat. I didn't know you could use forms, so. Yeah, you used to be able to. Now when you do it, it's a bit of an unknown. Now when you do it, it actually just it sort of locks you out. You get a little message that says you, you can't do this, but it looks like you can create the uh, the questions and answers that you want, and then it doesn't allow you to actually publish it into the um, into the meeting or into the into the conversation. I'm wondering if it's a, I mean, on the back end, I don't know if it's a, a traceability issue. You know, once the question's asked. Um, how it's recorded and what you can do with that data following is a bit of a question mark, but uh, the short answer is no. Unfortunately, I don't have a, an answer to when that's coming back, but let's hope it is soon because it was a it was a good feature. What's the difference with between that and the forms app in Teams? That was the forms app. It's still available, and I mean, I went out to my apps and I it's put a, a screenshot of it in there. Yeah, it's available, but if you go and actually fill it out and say, I think it's submit, it will stop you. Mm. Mm. That's which adds to the to the level of murkiness because there's no actual response to it. it gets, so, I mean, it, it, while while waiting for that, I mean, you can still go create things out in forms and just provide the link and have people go outside of teams to use it. So forms still works. Uh, yeah, I, look, I, I mean, to have everything in one interface, like, yeah, of course, uh, you you want it there as part of that. You know, you don't want people clicking between applications and leaving a, a meeting. But then again, with the pop out meeting, we're all reading email and doing other stuff while this is going on anyway. So I'm sorry, Christian. I was doing something else. What were you saying there? <laughs> <laughs> I just got that this morning. Yeah. Well, I just concluded my game of solitaire, so I'm I'm 100% focused. Did you lose again? Uh, of course. Yeah. I just give up. Consistency is very important there. Yep. Or moose wiggle. Well, here. So here's the 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 real last one here. Um, Susan asks. I actually I don't know the question. I didn't research this one. I'm interested to know if you guys know the answer. Uh, Susan asks. Does anyone know if I can see the list of praise or badges? that someone has received in Teams? And where is that stored? I went looking for this one, and after five or 10 minutes, could not come up with where it was stored. It shows up in Dell, so I'm assuming it's in SharePoint somewhere. It's in a list in SharePoint. Is it in the Exchange side, though? Is it an Exchange? Maybe. 
If I had a nickel for every time I heard the phrase or said the phrase, it's in SharePoint somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared with all of you because we'd all be retired. Yeah. I'd have multiple nickels. But the gamification shows up in Doe. I mean, and I don't know if it's gamification from not only teams, because you used to be able to get gamification from uh, what other app would give you the, um, I'm trying to remember. You can get them on tech community, but. Yeah, but no, this was in 365. Yeah, I mean, Yammer has that stuff. Yammer, that was it, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah well, the. Teams has it just doesn't have a very I, when when Teams was launched four years ago three and a half years whatever it is now I don't know time doesn't matter anymore um, back in that parallel universe when Teams uh, launched and there was some talk around some of the gamification uh, capabilities and I think that I, I mean I I expected some people expected a bit more of the strengths of the gamification over in Yammer to kind of merge and come over. Um, but that's why, like this, this could be another piece of homework if somebody wants it to go find out where this is. I'm trying to understand what the purpose would be. Why, why would you need what, to know what badges and things that other people have? Well, if you're a manager, if you want to go in and track that stuff on a going basis, yeah, usually, usually that's given out by. So if I'm in a if I'm in a tenant that doesn't belong to me, and they give me gamification, I'm not going to show up in my tenant. It's not going to show up in, in anywhere, you know, it only shows up in the tenant that I'm in. So yeah. you wouldn't care, it wouldn't bring, you wouldn't be able to see it. I, I suspect this is within the context of a single tenant. Yeah, that would uh, be my assumption too. I, I get that point. I agree. Uh, and I wouldn't expect to go in as a guest and be able to, to, to see that, you know, who's received badges within that that tenant um there's a whole other question of you know what you see from guests and if you apply badges and what's viewable by the manager but where all that stuff sits who can see it whether that's shared out i mean because my next question is like if, I, if this is if susan's an end user wanting to be able to go and see this uh, and i don't know the answer to but is the, is the manager have the ability to go and create a leaderboard and publicly like publish that information is there a limitation on that, or is it is it not publishable information? So, I'll I'll take that one. I'll go take a look and and try to come back with the response. Really? So, yeah, I, I'm answer? interested in finding the answer. I will I will do that one. Yes. Wow. All right. <clears throat> well, yeah, because, because you know, Mike, organizing this step and running it and live streaming and editing the video and posting it. It's not enough. I'm sitting on Easy Street. I got to do more. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting yeah. for something like that. I know. I was, I was saying that, knowing that. Uh, yeah, that was. Check, check yeah. with our friends at uh, at Tigraph. I wouldn't be surprised if they yeah. had some insights there. Yeah, I also got an open badges app there. These are out on uh, the stuff to interact with badges is on github and so wherever the takeoff point is for storage i'm sure you're going to find in a github project if you want to purpose the code well i'll i'll do a little more digging i'll, I'll try and have that for uh tonight's session for those that are watching if you uh, are interested if you like the format we're going to be back at 6 p.m pacific well not eric uh, he's got to get I, his now one of these i keep saying 12 it. to 14 hours of beauty sleep every night so i'm yeah. going to pop in and surprise yes. Gets yeah. longer each time. Yeah, you keep saying that. <laughs> but uh, thanks everybody for for uh, for joining and uh, and for again if you, this is your first time watching this thing, so the uh, you can go out and you can find all of our past episodes. Didn't mention this is episode twenty five, the first half of wow. episode twenty five. Mm -hmm. so we've been doing this for twenty five weeks now. Yay, COVID. What is wrong with us? <laughs> Um, but I publish things, these out to my blog at buckleyplanet.com, uh, as well as they're all out, out on YouTube. So I, my, my commitment is I'm trying to get them out same day. So late tonight on this holiday uh, here in the U.S., I will still take the time to publish it and and uh, push it out there. Um, the, the joys of not having small children around and being an empty nester. 
Uh, I've got time for stuff like this on a Monday night. So anyway, but uh, thanks, gentlemen. And uh, thanks for everybody that's watching uh, online. I'm going to hit pause on the stream. Can you guys stick around for a minute for yep. a brief discussion? All right. Thanks. And let me turn off the live stream now. It's almost becoming an involuntary reflex for me. Yeah, well, I just, I, I would have done it next is I'm refreshing my screen over here to get the, make sure the, let me share it out. So live stream is going. Going, going, gone. And I've got like 50 tabs open from my homework. <laughs> Careful, it might be sucking all the memory out of your box. Yeah, I know, no, I probably am. Uh, so let me share this out. Especially with teams. Share that there and there. That Tony Redmond article on teams and memory consumption was pretty good. Apparently, yeah. it's built on the uh, same kind of engine that uh, Chromium based browsers are. And so a lot of it's uh, that memory goes to caching and it's supposed to be, it's like SQL Server, which grabs like most of your available RAM and then releases it as necessary. Yeah. But you've got that going on with your system. So. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what makes me feel uncomfortable. My system is all bogged down. <laughs> yeah, uh, like but you got to release something. I, I, and I do, I, I do release that. <laughs> uh, what a way to start. Uh, Hey this folks, we talk probes. <laughs> this morning, talk about this is release. the follow up. Yeah, follow uh, yeah. So this is the Microsoft Community <laughs> Office Hours, and myself, Sean McDonough, Hal Hostetler, and uh, I don't know if we'll have Mike join us this evening, but that's all right. Uh, so we do have some stuff. So we're if you have questions, feel free to post them in the uh, the live stream. So we're in a couple locations out on Facebook, uh, and uh, we'll try to address those. I did have the homework, um, and it's not done. I'm waiting for responses back. But I'll tell you, I'm, I dug through and read about 20 different articles, uh, well, most of which people, are still we'll open. Tell people what the uh, yeah. topic yeah. was you're researching. Um, so there was a question about whether, uh, um, in fact, I was going to go and open up the question here exactly. Um, it was about um, the praise features in Teams. Uh, where is it? Here it is. So Susan had asked, does anyone know if we can see a list of the praise or badges someone has received in Teams and where is this stored? Uh, so what I discovered is that there are about a half dozen praise related reporting analytics requests in user voice. Hmm. Uh, a couple of them. Uh, yeah. So, so thank you for not answering the the need and having it something out there, Microsoft. No, it's uh, <laughs> let me let me find it. So, um, yeah. So here's three. Let's see where is it? Where is it? Uh, do, do, do. Thought I had them open. I must have uh, must have closed them down again. Okay, here here's one of them. So turning praise into trackable badge app. Um, custom praise images, which is actually uh, something that you can go out there and do. Um, make the praise badges displayable as part of a person's profile to display on the banner. Um, there's there's just a bunch of them like that around the praise capabilities. So so there is the ability now, and there's an article that's out on Docs, and let me grab it, and it's called Manage Your Apps uh, in, no, oh, that's not it. There it is. Manage the Praise app in the Microsoft Teams Admin Center, uh, which kind of walks you through. It says how you could go and you can use the out of the box uh, uh, images there and give people praise. There's the link to that article there. And let me post it over in Facebook as well. There it is. Um, so you can uh, uh, so you could go in and modify those icons, and so you can customize those icons. And it's a multi-step process. It's not it's, it's out of the box, but you essentially go and set up a a, a, a gallery uh, in SharePoint to be able to uh, go in there and and uh, you know, add these items in it, um, create custom badges, 
Um, you know, change the color of each of them, the names around it, the imagery. Um, it gives you some best practices on creating custom badges, things like that in the article. Um, and, and, and so it's links to each of the ones that are out there, out of the box. However, what do, it doesn't answer is, well, then where is that data actually stored? Well, if you're going to go and create, um, let me see, read here, where is it? Uh, so if you actually go in and create this at this catalog, image catalog out through SharePoint, then you're going to have the data and you're going to be able to track, uh, you know, some uh, aspects of it through in usage of those apps through that method, but there's nothing that's out of the box. You'd have to go and build something to track that. As I mentioned in this morning session, because we're talking about um, giving praise and tracking praise activities within the threaded discussions within channels, that's the exchange workload where that activity is happening. So I have to believe and I've not found any uh, articles out there yet, any guidance on this, but that it's it's traceable, it's it's quantifiable through the you know the exchange workload. I did reach out as we talked about to Ed and John at Tigraph, since they are the 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 kind of the experts on all things uh, metrics analytics out of Microsoft 365, especially all the social tools. I have to believe that they have this know it inside and out and probably already have it built into their tooling. In fact, I'm confident that they do already have that within their tooling because they are tracking similar capability over in Yammer and, and so they have been for years. Um, Tell so me that, that at least one of them said to you, badges, we don't need no stinking badges. Nobody said that, but thank you for bringing that <sighs> up. I know. Of course, I do the, I do the Weird Al Yankovic version of that Badgers, badgers. <laughs> we don't need no stinking badgers. <laughs> yeah, well, you can imagine how much it was, how much fun it was around here. The uh, the Tucson High mascot is the badger, and uh, Friday nights uh, was often the guy running the camera controls in. Uh, for for the 10 o'clock newscast and there was two of us in there one money the switcher and me on the cameras and every time a tucson high score would come up we did that very exact routine badgers we don't need no stinking badgers <laughs> sounds like a college drinking game oh yeah. yeah well it was it was kind of cool and unfortunately that that fellow passed away about a couple months ago oh. kind of sad well uh, and his I... name was paul bean so paul bean yeah. No, uh, he, was with the, yeah he was with Channel 4 for, for, for a lot of years. A lot of years. Master control. Aside well, from the point. I was going to make another Badger comment. Okay. Um, of course, I just put a Sour Patch Kid in my mouth and uh, uh -oh. salivating everywhere on that. <laughs> so Don't my, lick your my, fingers. <laughs> my first trip what, I'm going to give myself the COVID? Come on, Sean. No, you're going to just get everything all sticky. You know <laughs> that it. That was so I don't get anything sticky. That's why I That's licked That's what you think. Off. Yeah. We know so anyway, how this works. My first trip over to Scotland, and I was over visiting my good friend, so Mike Watson, as you know. Um, uh, and we're driving. We did it. We, I'm trying to remember where that first trip was. I think we were going to uh, that the, the castle where they were. Uh, we were going over to the golf course and the beach where uh in um uh crap i just my mind went blank of the uh the the, the running movie from the early 80s um chariots of fire chariots of fire the beach where they were running on the beach uh, at the beginning of chariots of fire we we're going over to that me in. there was some like dummy in the uh, chain mail his head and you said sean <laughs> it's still posted. I, I'll find the image. Oh, that, that's awesome. Anyway, so we were going over to whatever that famous that that location. There's a yeah the 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 golf course and there's a, a graveyard and the castle ruins and stuff over there. My point on the way there, we're driving along and there's a sign with a big red triangle, and it says "Badgers" with an exclamation. <laughs> So 
I'm like, is that a warning? Is it a statement of fact? It was just an exclamation of badgers. You know, like, what? That somebody tell me what number. that sign means. It was, it, I, I just thought it meant like badgers. <laughs> yeah, anyway. All right. That was Perfect. my crack. Uh, and I, we never saw a badger while we were driving around Scotland, but oh. it was apparently it's enough of a problem that they had to create a sign to point out that they are they are there. They're loud and proud. All right. OK, so uh, that was my uh, uh, I'm still ongoing homework around the, the praise Um and so uh, I'll actually have a follow up with uh, the Tigraph guys tomorrow. I've got another call, and so I'll bring that up, and I might have, and I'll put it into a blog post because I'm, I'm interested to know what data is captured, where it is, how it can be captured, if it can be captured, what's out of the box, what can be done, because I think that where where things, and I need to go explore what other uh, uh, user voice features around that are, because I think part of the question that I think. Um, that I interpret Susan wants there is that anybody can go in and see like a leaderboard, like a leaderboard capability of, so, you know, one, I would say a manager wants to be able to go in and look at for all of my direct reports or my project team, whatever it is, I want to be able to see the tally of the different badges that have been handed out, the ones that we have approved of, as an organization. Um, but you want to, you do that kind of stuff. It's nice. You see it. But it, it's uh, to really start util utilizing that, the gamification capabilities and the praise features, you need to be able to tally those things. Now, having said that, we're talking, that's the out-of-the-box praise app in Teams. There are third-party gamification tools that are out there, praise tools, which will then, will provide, you know, and, and I don't know what's free or what's paid. I've not done any in-depth research on that. I'll go take a look and, and find some of them. But that generally a third party app will provide the metrics around that because that's an important aspect of that gamification is to have that leaderboard, have that tracking. So partial response on my homework. There we have it. I still haven't done the other one, haven't had time today. My other homework is to do the research on the free Teams app. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to it eventually. Don't rush me. What is that one? <laughs> That's right. That yeah, that was the trip. So I know it's difficult to see for those that are watching here. I'll let me click on it. <laughs> you gotta share it. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, it's like disappeared. Never mind. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. It would. It'd be. It's good to share, Sean. Come on. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. Obviously, you confused Watson with it. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Uh, any other homework from this morning? Was it just me? It was just you. Okay. You're long overdue. All right. And we, uh, so we talked about the forms app. Um, oh, here we are. So the next question comes from someone named Christian, not me. <laughs> So confusing when we have questions with people with the same names. Um, so this is, can you help me? I would like to, this is number 12, by the way, gents. Yeah, uh, I'm there. I would like to make recordings in Teams, but I don't want my video to appear in the recording, just everyone else's video. I, I do want my video to be on during the call. I don't want it to appear in the recording. Is there a way to do this? Um. I don't know, Christian. You're the expert at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Clearly not, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, so out of the box, the answer is uh, no. There is not a way of doing that. Um, I what We did talk about this morning about wanting to do some other advanced video features, and what you have to use is a third party, an external... Uh, application to record to capture the feeds coming in and and display that. Um, Christian needs a producer. That's right. So you essentially you need a producer to go and put that together and run it through something like OBS, which is the open broadcast software, uh, open source 
software that I'm utilizing and I'm utilizing the, uh, what is it? I always forget the name of this. It's the uh, Streamlabs flavor of OBS uh, because they've streamlined, hence the name Streamlabs, streamlined via Streamlabs. Um, and uh, yeah, you need to have this third party application to be able to capture that. And some of the, um, and Sean seems to be frozen in time there. Uh oh. Yeah. Something happened to him. Yeah. So unprofessional. Ah, uh, sadly I've been there. Yeah. We all have. We've that's, all been you know, there. That's, that's I don't know if you hear it in the background or not, but that that's how I fixed it. My issues with my, my little surface here, uh, not wanting to do full fledged teams meetings with cameras, video, and stuff. It's uh, it's it's oh, like it's not going to show up. Not with your background on. Oh, well, let me uh, let me uh, there. Okay, there. Yeah. so. Little fan. Uh, $9 at Walmart, yes. I just stick it behind on the back end, and uh, <clears throat> yeah. lo and behold, I can make it through a whole meeting without freezing. I'm Good. delighted. Nice. Is that what it is? It's just overheating back there? Yeah. The surfaces have got a thermal throttling feature to them, and uh, when they get hot, they slow down. Yeah. And in my case, it was a getting thermal slow. feature. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Uh, let's jump in. So, yeah. So the well, I, I think we've answered that. Uh, so, so when when you're using OBS, one of these third party uh, you know applications, you can go in there and set up your various scenes. Um, you can take the video content. You can arrange it however you want it to look. Uh, if you're taking, uh, you know, the like with the NDI capability that Teams has now, if that's enabled for your organization, which essentially allows you to pull in each of the video feeds of the participants as a separate feed, you can then go set up your scenes in a way where you exclude yourself from what is being captured. Um, I don't have that set up to be able to, to demonstrate that. In my view, as you can see right here, you see Hal's giant head and I'm little um, down there in the stream. Uh, if there were enough of us, we'd be in together mode. Um, yeah, does doesn't make a difference with with only two of us on here. You know. <laughs> but um, you know, so that's that's, that's just uh, that's straight out of SCTV, folks. Yeah, I'm I'm in a little in picture for those that are watching the recording on YouTube. It's going to show us side by side. When Sean comes back, it'll split us up and you know the gallery mode. Um, but that's the way that you can go in and do that. It's it's a it's a little more involved than, hey, in 30 minutes, can I get set up? The answer would be, uh, no, you cannot in 30 minutes set up. It's not out of the box. It takes some configuration, some time to set up. Thanks for rejoining us. Yeah, my computer decided to put me in timeout. So uh... Yeah, well, it's about time. So... <laughs> uh, let's see. Um... So that's recordings and teams that Christian was asking about um, using OBS. All right. So question 13, Kev asked a question. Uh, yesterday, I've got an update for my Office 365 current channel, and suddenly I lost the option, new meeting and calling experience in Microsoft Teams, which was active. And since then, I didn't get it back. I've already deinstalled Teams or deleted the cache. Today, I also deinstalled Office 365 and reinstalled it. I really don't get it, what, get it what happened. Someone else with the same issue. I want my new meeting and calling experience back. We want it Best back I for you. Tell. Best yeah. I can tell, that's on the back end. That's, uh, that's the focus of Microsoft. The thing of it is, is Teams is not part of your Microsoft 365 update that takes care of Pretty much everything but Teams. Teams yeah. is its own little entity. It gets updated by itself, and features coming and going is certainly something I've experienced. So, yep. Gosh. So, here's Any a chance he could have lost his license. Uh, I didn't have a problem getting back into it and everything else there. It'd just no. be weird that 
he'd lose like that feature. I don't know that, that that's not something that's premium that he would be downgraded in the service and you get some other notification. No, I, mean, I was about to say that, you know, with like the together mode and the gallery view, the, the larger gallery view, I had that used it. Um, so you set it in your own view. Like if we had uh, one or two more people, I'd be able to go in for the live stream and change this to together mode. Well, I had it for several days or a week and we did an episode with together mode. And then the next week, the episode, I went in there and it was gone. The option mm. was gone. The ellipsis. Yeah. So to, to Hal's point, it wasn't something we did or that I did. It was something. Oh, it was service. something you did. Well, uh, well, that's <laughs> that's that's a subplot. But yeah, the primary story is that agreeing with Hal that uh, it's a it's a service issue, and something that Microsoft did. They were I don't know rolling back some piece, and it, it on on my tenant, it it tweaked something temporarily. I don't know. Yeah, that's that pretty much matches my experience. I've had things there. I was using it, went away, and it well, okay, go turn it back. Wait a minute, where to go? Yeah, so that's one okay. that. So, so what's the answer to that? I mean, just time heals everything. <laughs> <laughs> time returns all features. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would put in a service ticket. I mean, just to get clarity on that. But um, yeah. Right, but that's a that's another good point. So one, you know. If a day later it's still it's it's missing, um, open up a ticket. Um, the other thing would be, I mean, does it hurt to go in and just? It's it's kind of like uh, looking at permissions. Did permissions change in SharePoint? Suddenly, I lose the capability to do something. Nine nine out of ten times, it's a permissions issue in SharePoint. Uh, did in so my experience with Teams has been when there's a loss of capability that then an admin made a change, a licensing change. So that, it, well, that could cause some other problems. I don't think that's the case here, but you can always go and look just to ensure that your, your license didn't get changed. And one other thing about that, uh, if that is a service-related issue, you need to close and restart Teams a couple of times. Uh, that's the way it works with Outlook, too. If they goof, that's well, like that instance that I told you about a few bag, weeks back where they made a service change and Outlook would just simply come up and go away. That they fixed the service change, but people had to stop and restart Outlook a couple of times for this yeah. for the client to pick up the service change. This kind of is the same thing that Teams does. And the point that I'm making with that is that <clears throat> Teams. You don't just click the little X at the corner and expect it to go away. It's you've got to. No, wait, you do just it. click on it and expect it to go away. That's <laughs> not what happens. Yeah, just. OK, <laughs> semantics being what they are. <laughs> Seriously, you have to go in and make sure that it is completely gone from your from your uh, system, system tray, tray. And you yep. might you might also want to just just for good measure, make sure that there's nothing lingering around with under uh, I'm, um, oh gosh, and I'm going to forget the name of that now. The you know, task manager. There we go. Oh. Yeah, just just to be sure. And you may have to do a stop and restart a couple of times for that that service to pick back up. Um, that's a presuming, and I think it's a pretty reasonable presumption that that that, that was a service issue. Yeah, agreed. You know, it, yeah. So no. and if, if they as they roll stuff out, they don't do it in the block. They do it. Tenant by tenant, this region, that region, they feel it out, do things, see who complains. It's right. A well, that's why you, but that's how it's done. It's real well, systematic. Yeah, your your admin also <laughs> needs to go in and and make sure that there's not some known issue. There's some other outage on uh, a service. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there 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 could be a number of things going on. That's why I said, oh, time heals that that problem for me with together mode. It came back. It was like three or four days. It was gone. I don't know what the deal was. Uh, I had the other night. I was trying to figure out what was wrong with Outlook. I go into service uh, dashboard, and I've got like five services that are degraded. Right. And I'm only experiencing problems with one. I'm like, wow. I'm thinking I'm getting screwed, but I'm getting off lucky. Only one out of five. So, yeah. Well, it's important to just be be aware of this. This was a hard transition for a lot of organizations. 
of moving to the cloud and where, you know, like, uh, you know, in, in Teams, like SharePoint Online, uh, where you are, there, there is no more, uh, uh, y- y- there is no. Uh, Who do I yell at? Yeah, there's no admin overall, uh, farm admin. You know, you're, you're just at that, that uh, site collection. Like, that's it. So you are, uh, you are also subservient to the, the Microsoft gods, what they want to do. And it took uh, some time before they could convince people on either side of them in the management chain that they were no longer a factor in the online running of things. Well, who do I yell at? I, it was a very common question. You know, what's my next escalation point? You go to Microsoft. Well, I don't like that. Well, then get out of the cloud. That's, that's your option. Hey, there's a, there's a lot of reasons that uh, organizations have, uh, uh, you know, for having hybrid solutions. Um, and so there were, there's a reason why a number of organizations were, did kind of a graduated move into the cloud and exchange was often the leading workload, the most mature to move over to the cloud. Um, doesn't, doesn't have a lot of the complexities of, of like a portal of SharePoint. Um, but Teams is a 100% cloud-based solution. So there is no on-prem option. You like it or you don't use it. Going back to those Skype servers. Yes. Mm. Uh, let's see. If you are watching the live stream, if you do have any questions you'd like us to uh, attempt to address, <laughs> can't promise that, we'll, that we will attempt. But you have to pay extra for us to do it seriously. This is one of my favorite responses. So we may not know the answer to your problem, but we admire the problem. And we will have fun with it. I don't know the answer, but good for you. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, David Wilkinson. Yeah, David, number 14. So got a question. We are in full flow now of getting the full company onto Microsoft Teams. As part of the process, we are turning on each user uh, as and when their department and team go live within their team or with their team. We are currently going through each member and manually enabling the team's license for them. Is there a PowerShell command in accompanying a CSV file that could make this a far easier process for us and quicker? Oh, this is going to be my homework, isn't it? I've actually been like that. Just answered, asked to answer, I think, a few weeks ago, was it not? Licensing was actually the first place that I got in on the uh, PowerShell out in the cloud. Uh, People were trying to allocate licenses and things. It's a very common request. Um, Yeah, this this we kind of talked about this this morning too. I think some of these requests of how do I automate some of these capabilities? Yeah, do globally. I seem to recall that it came up. I don't recall how it was addressed or if it was addressed by us. But, well, let me take this one. So, David. All right, David. I'll see if I can find an old script and adapt it. But licensing is, you're right, David, it is a very common request, and there are plenty of, everybody who spends any time in the cloud has at least one or two scripts that end up getting adapted to do the uh, enabling of licensing or adding. Um, in a lot of cases, the you know they'll actually do it uh, smart in smart fashion. You know, if somebody's already got a license that covers the desired workload, you won't add another one to them so as to you know minimize the number of licenses you're deploying and all those things. But we'll put something together and see uh, what comes out next week. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, and that, by the way, so we'll our next time for the, you know, if uh, David happens to be listening in, that's uh, or watches the recording. So we'll be back at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific on Monday. The what is the date? 14th. 14th. All right. Number 15. Uh, Sheila, Sheila. As how can I create one group calendar so that my team has access to document when they are off? Uh, this is different than a shared event. Yeah, so you want a group calendar for vacation or, or personal time. You can put it in SharePoint. You can put it in Out or Exchange. 
Um, if you put it in SharePoint, you can also connect your Outlook client to it, and it'll Outlook, or excuse me, Outlook will treat it like a standard Exchange calendar, even though it's based in SharePoint. Uh, so you can make changes in either location. So it's kind of up to you. There's different ways to do it. Is there a calendar option in the new list app? Is one of the templates a calendar? I don't know. I haven't looked. It's sad to say, but I have not looked at the list app. Because I know the teams that I mean, the teams calendar and what comes with a you know team. That's like that's not the place to go and do it. You want to create something separate specifically for this purpose. I mean, this this is a solution which uh, I mean, going back, and I might even have a book on the shelf, uh, you know, back in the 2010 era, where it was a common request for SharePoint to go yeah. and build something like this. And that way, you can have a form, you can have an approval process on it, uh, an info path form. Yes, <laughs> high quality. Yes. Uh, yeah. So there are you know there are a number of options, but unfortunately, Teams natively is not the place for it yeah and i would be surprised if there wasn't a a, a team's calendar app out there some third-party app that's available that could also be utilized for this purpose i'm sure there's more than one yeah but at its simplest shayla i would just go into uh sharepoint behind the scenes and add a calendar and permission it the way you want and then surface that in Teams. And like I said, um, if you're in SharePoint, you can do the connect to Outlook thing where your uh, client, Outlook client will be able to uh, work with the calendar and you can make direct changes within the Outlook client. Um, and those will be reflected out in the uh, SharePoint calendar and vice versa. People make change. I mean, this is what my wife and I do to stay abreast of events with each other. Sad to say, but yes, that's what kind of got us into the SharePoint realm was to share a calendar. Love by SharePoint. Yeah, just did a quick search just in what I have available. I just the word calendar. There's the calendar bot, the Virto calendar, the Chronofoy, Chronofoy, Chronofi, I don't know. And then there's also uh, the next set group calendar. Um, so you've got a number of options. You can go and search on more apps and, and find some of these things which are already available in the store so they're accessible through you got to make sure that you go go look for it make sure it's uh, you know approved you can do a search out online if you're not finding what you're looking for do kind of a broader do a google search uh, as sean said there's probably many uh calendars out there that include some of the automations that you're you're looking for otherwise you know you can go and build exactly what you're talking about but it takes a little more effort to go and build that uh within sharepoint yeah, but very little. I know. But uh, more than zero development needed. More than zero, yes. All right. Uh, Christian <sighs> is back with another. Christian, yeah, what yeah. is this? Your namesake. I, I think the guy's right, got it. It's still not as cool of a name as uh, earlier today. Uh, Pablo Garfunkel. Garfunkel, yes. That name rocks. <laughs> yeah, so, I, yeah, I'm so, envious of that. so Christian says, uh, hey folks, please help. What's the cheapest version of Microsoft 365 that will allow me to record Teams calls with people from outside of my organization? So guests. Can it be done with the Microsoft 365 business basic plan? Mm. I think that's an E3. If you have teams, if you're not free, didn't did we have a, you know another question that was similar? And didn't we figure out that it was anything yep. but the free version of Teams allows you to go in and capture or record? Well, I think we figured out that the free version of Teams is merely use of the Teams client. Is what we concluded. I can always add this, attach this to the part B of that homework I have around the free Teams version. Pot and Not like Hot Shots the movie. Yeah. yeah, I imagine if you just look through service details, the comparison matrix, you'll find it somewhere. Yeah. 
Just taking a quick note there. Yeah, there's a, yeah, I mean, increasingly, uh, it, you know, I find myself going and searching for those uh, comparisons out on docs at Microsoft.com uh, yeah. for a number of things just to look side by side. Like, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert in licensing. I mean, you need a PhD to be an expert in licensing of anything Microsoft. Yeah, uh, it is. But it's going and doing comparison, SKU comparison, on any given day, stuff changes. Like, I don't know. I have to go in and look constantly. Yeah. True story. Yeah, true story. Fact. Uh, all right, question 17. Uh, Mirko asks, I Pi plan to migrate from SharePoint 2013 to SharePoint Online with uh, SPMT. SharePoint uh, Migration Toolkit. Yep. Uh, how handle this in scenario, the page UI change from classic to modern? Grammar matters. Uh, for listed libraries, this is not the issue, but for sites, is there an option to change the UI afterwards from SharePoint Online sites with classic template? No. You essentially need to... So, Mirko, you can bring libraries and lists over, as you know, and give them the modern experience. Um, but if you want the modern experience on a site, you're going to have to start with one of the modern sites, whether it's a team site, modern team site, or the communication site. Um, you can later swap in sites, but they will be different in uh, constitution or uh, what they've got under the hood. So unless you guys know of a different way to do that. SharePoint question. I knew you'd be talking for a while. I ate some. Ate the, yeah, Sour Patch Kids. <laughs> I'm good for a few of them, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a tough one. People want, you know, it ends up, you just end up doing a, a different migration. Instead of bringing content over later, you can get the lists and libraries in as phase one and then work on the sites that is creating new sites and adapting them to the purpose of the classic site you have and phase those classic sites out. Hmm. Is Microsoft doing anything to kind of speed up the move from the classic to the modern? Well, besides the root site swap, um, I know that part of the performance stuff I know I mentioned this before, but um, they want to make sure that anything you're you're swapping is not going to start to degrade service. So mm -hmm. they're they're trying to provide as many tools and stuff that is good guidance and good advice baked into the platform in a way that you don't have to, as an admin, manually implement that or even be aware of it. Um, so there's a lot going on under the hood and evolving. Uh, kind of under the hood that we're all going to benefit from, but it's just not high profile stuff, at least at this point. Mm. Yeah, I seem to recall it, like reading something uh, a few weeks back um, about this, but you know, every once in a while you'll have an article where, you know, somebody in Microsoft is just encouraging people to uh, kind of make sure it's part of their strategy if they still have any remaining sites to move that across because that was I mean initially it was that was the big big push saying hey look you, you do it at your own speed as it makes sense move things across but when there's no imperative you're not there's no push to go towards something people just can figure out ah yeah I can just just juggle between have some of the modern and some of the classic and you know I know that they want to it's kind of like well how long did it take or are, are there still people in the old BPOS the dedicated <laughs> Cloud. I have no. There probably are, just like there's still people running 2003 portal servers. Um, right. Right. So it's uh, so I, there's there's maybe at most maybe a couple dozen customers that are still on BPOS. I know it's come down. When I was I saw Dave Walsh in uh, in Ireland at the European SharePoint conference, and Dave Walsh was my uh, was my old GM. So when I worked at Microsoft. Um, 15 years ago, um, not quite 15 years ago, but, um, you know, so he's the GM who hired me, but he, um, 
I, I, I asked him about it when I saw him. I was like, I said, you know, running into people from the teams that I, I'm, I'm interested. Are there still any of those clients out there? And he's like, yeah, they're still. We've gotten most of them off the platform and moved them over into the cloud. Uh, but there were still a, a number of large customers that had very complex environments that were still on that dedicated uh, platform. So they were, for all intents and purposes, were in the cloud. However, it was... It's basically like they they were paying Microsoft to be their outsourced IT organization for yeah. all of that, and uh, not a scalable a cloud. cloud. Yeah, it's a private cloud, dedicated cloud. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, I I, I I agree with you. I think there's I'm sure there's still a few out there. Uh, and then you ask the right people, and they'll just grumble. Uh, yeah. Yeah, which you can uh, accept as an affirmation that you're on. Yes. The Will asks a question, uh, presenters on live events ask me if there's any way for them to see themselves while presenting. You have a mirror right by your monitor. <laughs> Problem solved. Well, the simplest thing you do there is just whip up another laptop or something else or a screen, log yourself in as a, as a, as a viewer and watch yourself. Of course, the only thing that you might have to deal there would be, uh, would be, uh, echoes, latency. echoes, 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 echoes. Well, you mute it. Yeah, you turn it off. Yeah, you turn off the mic. Yeah, you mute the sound. If you know to do yeah. that, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, but that that was my first thought as well. Is just have like I've got my my just my Surface Pro over here, and and so I've done that where I've uh, uh, if, if if you have a producer so separately where you're you know logged in doing things and can kind of monitor if you're it's a bit much to have yet another screen with something else to look at if you're running everything yourself um, but yeah that would be the simplest way of doing that well, it's an old broadcasting trick every uh, every news show that you ever see there's there are monitors buried down on those desks so that all the news people can see exactly what they're doing oh yeah there's well, something the other the other way, you could also open up incognito, so another browser window, and and be logged yeah, in. Yeah. So, yeah, I use Rambox, uh, and so I have uh, rather than having multiple browser windows open, I have Rambox tabs that have logins to a number of guest networks, and uh, so I've used it for that way as well. That open browser tabs in the background, but yeah, right. Which is the same thing, but it's a it's a permanent it's yeah it permanently opens up to each of my tabs and right. Wonder if they've considered adding a teleprompter fe feature for people doing the presenting. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if that's out there. There's your million dollar suggestion, Hal. Ah. Hal, oh. you should take some homework and go research and see if that's something <laughs> out there. Maybe it's in user voice already. Yeah, well, you never know. I'll look. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Manpreet says, uh, can anyone else apart from organizer download attendance report in Microsoft Teams meeting? If yes, how is that possible? I it's not. think so. Nope. If you yeah. want to report, organize the meeting. Yeah, that's... Uh, you know, wow, can can I as an attendee get the contact information for everybody that was in the webinar that I was participating in? No, no, you cannot. Thank you for asking. Yes, we certainly have a draw for many, many more marketers during our webinars. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a uh, you know download an attendance report. No, but what you can do when we're talking about meetings versus a live event. Um, no, as a, as a, for the for the meeting, you can at any time go into the people tab and drag and drop the list of names of everybody that's in there. I mean, there's in a meeting where you're in a trusted environment uh, where you know you've been approved in with everybody else there. You can see those other pro profiles, those that are not guests and are logged in as anonymous if it's allowed, uh, and then capture all their information. Now, whether they're um, you know they were actively participating or what what have you like there's no other additional data that would just be their names and whatever contact information share shows like if i go in right here so i show participant here click on the top so the live stream you can see it 
and see there's no email there's other people that have wow all those people who declined this meeting this evening or not responded <laughs> wow <laughs> um, oh, well. yeah don't be a hater oh i can hate if i want to sean <laughs> haters gonna hate yep um all right and the last question that i had organized them all uh and, and again so no other questions that were asked out in the stream um my car my car um, asks we are seeing users who reports issues with selecting audio devices in the windows team app they are unable to select any audio devices both speaker and microphone are empty in the window, Windows setting, both speaker and microphone work properly, and Teams Web also works okay. Reinstalling the app does not resolve the issue. Anyone here who's had to deal with this issue? Seen strange things with uh, selecting. If you just add a device, uh, it might not appear very quickly. Or we've talked about before, I know numerous times, if you've got other applications that do uh, communications and grab, um, your input sources, they may not uh, respond, but typically they will show up. They just won't be selectable. I've not seen situations where they just don't show up. Do you guys get that? Uh huh. Huh. Here's where that happens when you are logged in as a guest into a guest network. Oh, okay? really? You can see differences between those. Yep. Hmm. And so um, there are differences between when you're logged in as a guest into a network versus your home network and some of those options. I don't know why that would be the the, the case, hmm. um, but I just know that I was struggling to uh, to go in and make changes. And uh, somebody mentioned that to me and I, I logged out of that session, logged into my collab talk tenant and voila. changed it, changed it and went back in and was able to get back in. Huh. That's good to know. I, I wasn't aware of that at all. That was a while back, um, like six months ago. So that's like a lifetime ago. It was earlier this year. I've had it fail to pick up the uh, difference between the built-in speakers and microphone and the headset mic and, and the earbuds from time to time. You plug something in and it, it doesn't follow. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Oh, and I've also had occasions where I've plugged the headphones in, unplugged them, and it, and it didn't follow backwards. Yeah, it, it won't uh, keep real-time data on device enumeration. Well, as we've talked about often, plug-and-play, the days of plug-and-play are dead. Plug-and-pray. Yeah. But to that point, it's, it's um, team seems to be hypersensitive to any changes to audio, any audio and video cameras as well any devices. So if you switch out of Teams over to another application or to a browser and do something, your live stream in Facebook or or record something in OBS or using Camtasia or whatever, come back into Teams, you have to always check your audio and video. It's like, we'll never get rid of these. Like, can everybody hear me? Is, is Can you see my screen? <laughs> like that. Sure. I know. It's always gonna happen. It's always gonna happen. Uh, and, and until there's plug and play, and when you know that, hey, I can set it globally, it is a move. No matter what application, I mean, I, I always use the same mic, the same camera, and yet both of my giant monitors have speakers built in, have microphones built in, and occasionally I never select them, and it will jump over to one of them. Mm. Mm -hmm. So and that gremlins, I'm pretty sure it's gremlins. Eh. Device yeah. enumeration might be the only thing responsive <laughs> at the time. Yeah. You say yeah. plug and play is is dead. I am just let's put it this way. I do not want to go back to the day of manually sorting through all the interrupts that I allocate to my devices. knowing that you shouldn't put anything on IRQ7 and all sorts of stuff like that. And if you're that old. You know. So you so you you think that uh you know user error could play into this somehow? Is that what you're saying, Sean? Oh, no, no, I'd never suggest such a <laughs> silly thing. That's You're talking uh, crazy now, Christian. I know. I know. It's crazy talk. 
All right. Well, that's the end of the, the questions that we have here. Um, it, wow. We've got a couple of folks that are watching on live stream. If you've got any questions, go ahead and post them. We'll try and address them. Anything else that's come up today? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but not that I can talk about. <laughs> that sounds One promising. Of the, uh, Nothing I that did. deals with, uh, with Windows or SharePoint in your office. Yeah. Yeah. The... Uh, um so i'm uh, looking forward to this week i've got a conversation with an mvp we're talking about so i've got a a series i'm going to be doing with um with uh, mario trenton another mvp uh around project and all of the the nuances all the stuff that's happening um differences between planner and project online project desktop uh, and uh, Azure DevOps, and and moving in between those those things, and uh, what suggestions, what things are on the roadmap to be able to communicate between from to do with the very much end user and planner application for an individual end user, small teams, all the way up to the complex project plans, uh, and in uh, you know, DevOps, which is more on the SCM, the the software configuration management side, so source code management. And uh, you know, issue tracking there for software teams. Um, there, there is an effort to go and bridge some of the sharing of tasks across those things. And I don't know to what degree. I'm going to be learning a lot. I'm excited to find out more about it. But so I'm, yeah, going to I think kicking that series off, recording some stuff. I'm not sure when will it'll go live, but later this month, some stuff will go live from that. It'll be interesting. We yeah, so that it'll be interesting. I mean, uh, you know, with Team Foundation Server, we granted TFS doesn't exist as such really much anymore, but we had SharePoint integrated in that, and you would, you know, try and resolve all code check-ins to items uh, and issues, and, you know, there was something of a workflow there. I'd be interested to see how much further that's evolved since then, because that was quite some time ago. Yeah, well, that was the evolution. It was, what, TFS to Visual Studio Online, and uh, Azure DevOps is kind of the uh, heir apparent. So, yeah, it, I'm going to get a, kind of a history lesson. I'm in, I'm excited to find out kind of what happened. So I, I I left that space. That's where I started my career. Was in the project portfolio management side of things, and kind of you know then moved over to knowledge and information management systems and collaboration technology. So I'm excited to find out what happened. So I, I have the 25 year ago version uh, still in my head. Well, I'm glad you didn't uh, finish that off with, and now I'm going back there for my career to die. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? There, there. It's still a, it's a noble profession. Window <laughs> washers. <laughs> Weren't we talking about COBOL programmers this morning? Uh, I was just thinking yes, IT, I crowd, that. IT crowd. Where he's like, I'm not a window washer. <laughs> Sees his old call. Yeah. Anyway, all right. I tell people I'm a glorified sandwich fetcher. That's my team contribution. Subway run. <laughs> also, you're a t-shirt model. That needs to be on your resume, Sean. And I'm dead sexy. <laughs> Get in my belly. Get yeah. in my belly. Uh, all right. Yeah, any, anything else go? We got another uh, five and a half, six minutes. No other questions coming through over there. You know, I have to say... It's been several weeks since we had a true dead spot where we didn't have questions or had some stuff on there. So this is, uh, you know, some. it's good to have some us time. Well, yeah. Well, you did omit your obligatory five minutes of uh, going on about Riz needing his uh, sleep. So yeah, there's that. That, that, that's our gap, I think. It's less funny when he's on and for us to... <laughs> Oh, a difficult time, but yeah, um, yeah. Anything else going on? Interesting this week? Any? Uh, there's, um, you know, one thing that I was noticing. My calendar. Globalcon three. Is that this week? That's, yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. I got a session airing on Thursday, and I'm sure you've got at least one airing at some point, Christian. I'm not. No? I'm not doing this one. No, I had too much going on. Wow. How about you, Hal? Next one. 
Nope. So, I'll be watching. So those that are watching, Sean, what is GlobalCon 3? Uh, GlobalCon 3 okay. is an event put on by the Collab 365 guys. Mark Jones over in the UK. Um, obviously, they've done Global Cons, two of them prior to this. And he's done all sorts of other events. They really, Sean? There have been <laughs> GlobalCon 1 and 2? Revelation, I know. It's so amazing. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah. I'll post the link here. Yeah. And um, he's got a number of different ways you can get in. Uh, you can do the free thing if you want, you know, premium access to premium content for quite some time to come. There's that sort of option. They really do provide some value adds on top of it. Um, but the conference itself goes tomorrow through Friday, I believe. Um, with many sessions and many different folks. If you go out to, you know, just search for Global Con 3, you'll hit it. Yeah. Um, tune in when you want. Uh, just make sure you, you got to register to get the code to actually um, participate as a, a viewer. But like I said, I think you can do that for free and yeah. be able to get Yeah, it. that part of it's free. Yeah, and you can watch all the sessions for free. It's just after... I don't know whether it's 30 days or something like that. If you don't have the paid access, it goes behind, behind a wall. And just yeah. and, and to pitch people to go and pay for really inexpensive for the past, but you also get something like 50 ebooks access to yeah. that are exclusive to the paid version as well. So yeah. not only do you get you know continued access to not just Global Con 3, but 2 and 1 content. But you get all those ebooks instantly as well. So you get tremendous resources for that paid license. At one point, they were given uh, like a micro jobs credit too. That's right. Um, so for folks who don't know it, uh, you know, people who operate as independents like Christian, myself, um, how are you an independent? I'm retired. So you're yeah. definitely independent, yes. <laughs> but nice. um, yeah. micro jobs is this idea of if anybody's familiar with the uh, concept of Fiverr, the site where you can go out and pay like five bucks and get all sorts of things done for five dollars. Um, micro jobs is sort of like that in the tech realm. Granted, most of the gigs are more than five bucks. Let me just but, say that the five dollar gigs on Fiverr, you get what you pay for for a lot of those. So. Yes, you do. Um, but some of them are really, I mean, they, you, there are diamonds in the rough, mm -hmm. but um, that's why I think they went to multiples of $5 out on Fiverr. But um, anyway, micro jobs is that concept that you pay a, a fixed cost for a fixed deliverable. Uh, work is highly described. Uh, people who do it are rated. Um, so you have, uh, you know, I've got one gig out there, which is I like to do... Um, exploratory dives into solution packages and assemblies for forensic purposes to, you know, fish stuff out after developers leave organizations or go through uh, life ending events. <laughs> and do you, do you probe into these organizations? Is that what you're saying? Uh, oh, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> Yeah. Way to end it. We're, right we're at the end. end on that note. Christian. No. Yes. I was just going to say that. So, GlobalCon 3, by the way, the full access pass is $93. So, really inexpensive to get all that content, too. That's the end of my pitch for GlobalCon 3. But yeah. at least uh, that's better than the um, probe. Yeah. Ending on a probe. And it, thank you for bringing that up again, Sean. Chew on your sour patch. We'll end on this. <laughs> so now that I'm chewing on the sour patch kid again, thanks everybody for, who uh, dialed in. Or if you're watching the video, again, you can go out to buckleyplanet.com. This is episode 25. It'll be on YouTube tonight. Um, Give our email address. If you have questions you'd like us to try and handle, attempt to answer, we'll do our best. Um, Unless it's um, unified communications telephony related, then we'll just laugh and then not provide any value. But you can email us at officehours at collabtalk.com. Uh, again, the video will be up on YouTube. And what's, if you go to YouTube or when it's up on the blog, 
there's a complete link list of every topic, every question we've answered with the timestamp. So you'll be able to jump to that point in the video. You do not need to wade through what is two hours of video to find the, the content that you that you need. You can jump right to that. And, and that so, is a serious yeah. value add that Christian himself supplies. And I genuinely yes, mean a value add. It's so. going to take me a couple hours to put the video together and get everything up there tonight, but I'll do it. So now you'll probably have to uh, survive a few, we'll say, questionable references by Christian, maybe in that uh, list of links, but it's well worth uh, what you get for it. Sean just upset because last week I pointed out some place where he was definitely um, spreading uh, bad information about trivial things, and I corrected him. A trivial correction to a trivial <laughs> <laughs> That makes it pretty much uh, infinitesimally small, right? Yes, it was. I, so I, so. Even, I was know, still right. Nobody ever said you weren't. Uh, I know. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, we'll uh, have a good evening. Have a great rest of the week. And uh, yep. um, the same. We'll you people in the online and out on the book of faces. Thanks for joining us, folks. All right. Yes. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye. All righty. Bye-bye.